So um, welcome everyone uh, to this first uh, talk guest uh, lecture of the U.S. Asian Law Institute at NYU Law School for the fall 2024 season. Um, and we have been well known, executive director of the Institute. And it's really a pleasure to be on the Super Series again. Uh, for those of you uh, in the room and online who are new to the Institute, I want to just say a few sentences about who we are, what we do. Uh, our mission is chiefly to educate. And we do that at the law school through the courses that we teach, such as our Usali uh, Colloquium on Globalization in Law and East Asia that we're teaching right now. And also we try to educate beyond the law school uh, practitioners, legal practitioners and policy makers about the role that law plays in East Asia, because as many of you will know, there is uh, a lot of uh, misunderstanding about law in East Asia and uh, some old ideas that have lingered from a century ago, and in particular, a lot of confusion about the role that law plays in an authoritarian country like China. So we try to challenge and to correct these kinds of misunderstandings and also to help legal scholars and professionals in East Asia to understand better how the law works in the US, which is to say not just the law in the books, but the law in practice. So we're trying to foster real conversations across legal jurisdictions. Uh, one way we educate is through our guest speaking program and uh, programs like the one we have today. Uh, on our website, you can read that Usali tries to uh, promote constructive engagement to advocate for legal reform. And that includes legal reform in our own country. Uh, we should be calling out injustice wherever we see it. And uh, one source of injustice in recent years has been the U.S. government's uh, efforts to protect uh, American businesses and American citizens against national security threats from China. Uh, now, the national security threats are real, and I and my speakers today are not trying to negate that or deny that. Um, but the programs to counter those threats are frequently poorly designed and uh, are based on the kind of misunderstandings that I just referenced uh, and have resulted in repeated racial and ethnic profiling of Chinese and Chinese American scholars and others. Uh, so security threats are like any other kind of risk or threat. We don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. Uh, we can't allow Asian Americans to become collateral damage in this heightened economic and geopolitical rivalry um, between the United States and China. Uh, so one last point I want to make is that while we uh, see this rivalry as a relatively new phenomenon, we have to acknowledge as well that the misunderstandings and stereotypes are not new. Uh, and one of the reasons that our ethics to counter uh, threats frequently devolve into racial and ethnic profiling is because of the, uh, these assumptions and these calcified ideas about Chinese culture, about Asian culture, about why people come to the United States, that those old tropes linger in our collective consciousness, uh, probably because of uh, old bad movies that you can watch on late night TV, and also because of bad scholarship. Um, so uh, if we could address these and recognize these misunderstandings, then perhaps we could more effectively come up with good, solid, effective, uh, and just programs that would address the national security threats more effectively. So that's kind of the starting premise of our program. Um, and uh, some of you will notice we titled it Perpetual Foreigners because uh, for so many years, uh, Asians were not allowed to become citizens of States. And then more recently, even after they were allowed to become citizens, uh, they were presumed to still remain loyal chiefly to their country's origin. And I saw, to my surprise, um, last night online, a recent survey found that among Americans, um, nearly 40% of Americans believe that Asian Americans are more loyal to their home country, their country of origin, than to the United States. So that is a really powerful. Uh, fact. That's a powerful uh, factor in these, in these policies. So our first speaker is Gisela Perez Cuscala, and she's the founding executive director of the Asian American Scholar Forum. She is an experienced civil rights lawyer, and she spearheaded a successful coalition that ended the China Initiative, which is a program we'll be talking about today uh, in the Justice Department, 
established in 2018 and in 2022 with the goal of ending uh, Chinese espionage and IP theft in scientific research at universities and in, in industry. Uh, a side note for NYU law students. Gisela has also partnered with our institute for the past two years in creating an externship program for NYU law students. Uh, this, uh, we call it the USALI AASF Fellowship. And the fellowship is a chance to work at the AASF on their legal and policy advocacy. Uh, and for the first time this academic year, we're offering the fellowship in the summer rather than during the school year. So it's a full-time paid position in the summer of 2025. Uh, so you can find the details on our website and on our docket. Uh, and as you listen to Gisela speak today about the work, you can consider whether you might like to work with her in the summer. So uh, also with us today is someone who can speak from uh, firsthand experience about the cost of a poorly designed national security program. Dr. Xiaoqin uh, Qi is a physics professor at Temple University, and he was wrongly accused in 2015 of uh, giving sensitive technology to China. The uh, FBI dropped the charges a few months later after they were arrested and the and the headlines about the charge. Uh, and then this happened, you'll notice, 2015, which was three years before the China Initiative, and so that is part of the argument I'm making that um, this is an this is more than just one initiative in my program. Um, and also with us is Jessica Bissett, who is the uh, director of the Government Engagement Project at the National Committee on U.S. China Relations, which is one of the oldest and most impactful organizations in the U.S. working on U.S. China relations, trying to improve uh, or foster a more nuanced view of understanding. And she and her colleagues have held a number of information sessions for FBI. Uh, officers in DC and our field offices to try to help them better understand the Chinese, uh, the Chinese American scholar community. So, if, if this community is going to be a target of concern, uh, then to help them understand who are they, what are their motivations, why are they here, et cetera. Uh, so, our order of discussion will be first, each of our speakers will make some remarks, and then we're going to have uh, questions from this audience and also from online. Well, first, thank you so much to my colleagues at the U.S. Asian Law Institute, especially Catherine, who's been such a pleasure with, to work with these past two years, um, but also in recognizing how critical legal scholarship is in this space. I will say, especially when we were working towards ending the Department of Justice China Initiative, attorneys played a very critical role in analyzing many of these cases and providing the sort of arguments that were compelling enough that would end the case enough to convince many within the government that this is really not the right approach. Um, and so as a civil rights attorney, I think it is a very unique space that is not oversaturated and needs as many uh, legal scholars to really join and be a part and be involved, whether it's uh, a semester during your law school or joining public service after you graduate. Now, I, I will also add, uh, as many of you also have an international focus, um, that I think it's really important to look at all of these issues from a human perspective. Um, even becoming an attorney, I work with many asylum seekers and refugees, um, leader of communities who are fleeing uh, persecution by the CCP, other refugees and asylum seekers fleeing violence, poverty, um, and persecution in their own countries. And so it is in part because of that background that I have a very strong belief of the United States as a safe haven uh, for many people who are seeking a better life. Um, and it's very critical for us to ensure that the United States continues to maintain its values and have many of us be a part of that effort. And so it was very disheartening to see uh, what was happening to many Chinese Americans and immigrants in our country, especially during this time. But it's also very important to recognize that for the Asian American community, this is not new, right? We have had a, a long history where it's become very easy to scapegoat Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners or as national security threats. Um, this happened long before COVID-19. 
um, though many of the anti-Asian hate crimes uh, put it on the forefront, but we saw it in terms of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, riots and hate against Chinese and Indian immigrants, to the Japanese incarceration during World War II. And now to the current heightened scrutiny that many Asian American scholars, particularly those of Chinese descent, are facing. And it becomes a very tired routine that essentially whenever the United States has tensions with a foreign country in Asia, that we experience this backlash for a subgroup because many of these stereotypes and insidious ideas, ideas continue to remain. As, as Catherine mentioned, there's a survey where about one third of Americans see Asian Americans as more loyal to their perceived country of origin. Keeping that in mind, it's not a surprise the backlash that Asian Americans face, not just in the cases that you're hearing right now with the China Initiative, but also during the pandemic. I will also add that we cannot look at the persecutions and targeting of Asian American scholars, scientists, and researchers in isolation. Many consider this separate from the anti-Asian hate issues that our country faces. But as I mentioned, there is the same underlying issue. It's a question of how loyal you are when you have, when you essentially have two different cultures. Um, I want to expand a bit on that survey that Catherine mentioned. In according to that survey, one in two Asian Americans feel unsafe in the United States. And nearly 80% of Asian Americans do not feel that they belong and are accepted. 47% say that what fueled anti-Asian violence was because people see Asian Americans as foreigners rather than Americans. This is a long lasting perception and it does have dangerous consequences for our community if we're not prepared. Many people forget, you of course hear the stories of Japanese American incarceration during World War II, but they forget what the, the rationale was by the federal government in why they rounded up so many uh, US residents of Japanese descent in these incarceration camps. The main rationale was that they were more prone to committing acts of sabotage and espionage. This is why it didn't matter where you were a citizen or you were a minor child, but everyone was swept under this broad brush that somehow your ethnicity could be an indicating factor of how loyal you are to the United States. And this is why Asian American Scholar Forum, we also work closely with the Fred T. Korematsu Institute. Um, their founder, Karen Korematsu, is actually one of our leadership council members, because we understand that this credit history is not just something for this moment, but something that the Asian American community continues to face time and time again. Now, what is happening right now and what's the state of play in our country? It's very important to know that just this week, the House of Representatives voted in a bill that would essentially reinstate the China Initiative under a different name. And so this means that we have not learned our lesson yet, that there continues to be efforts to bring back this initiative. Now, what was the problem with this initiative when it came about? The biggest issue with the China Initiative was that it led to an escalation and fear for the Asian American and scholar community. It essentially criminalized what many considered to be normal scientific and academic activities, although it purportedly alleged that it was seeking out espionage cases. Many of their cases were actually paperwork or administrative errors. And what made this even more difficult is that it was paperwork and administrative errors in a space where many of this paperwork was not even harmonized. So imagine that you're filling out a disclosure form for your university, but there was a time where it was actually encouraged that you go out there, you travel, you study abroad, and you do all of these things, and you would disclose many of these activities. But then the rules change. What you have to disclose change. What was considered problematic change. So it really started to feel like this was more of a gotcha moment for many of the Asian American scholars, scientists, and researchers, where regardless of how they filled out these forms, that they could potentially be in trouble because of the heightened scrutiny that they were facing by the Department of Justice, by many of the federal trade agencies, 
and by their universities who should really have been standing up for many of these professors. I do want to share with you two case examples that I think are really important because they started under the initiative and they ended right before China initiative. These two cases were what many of our advocacy groups can use to be able to argue that this initiative was not the right path. The first one was the case of Dr. Gung Chen. Dr. Gung Chen is actually one of the reasons why the Asian American Scholar Forum came into existence. He was a widely respected mechanical engineering professor and nanotechnology technologist at MIT. And his home was raided and, was, and he was arrested by the FBI on unjust allegations of federal grant fraud. His case is considered really what tipped everyone over. It was the moment where Asian American scholars decided that they were not going to just stay back in their classrooms and research lab, and they would actually be engaged in advocacy efforts, and the mantra of we are all Gang Chen spread across the country. Now, he was accused of failing to disclose connections with Chinese research in federal grant institutions, but also his loyalty was questioned the same day that he was arrested. Andrew Lelling had questioned in front of everyone whether he was loyal to his country. He suffered many consequences, both professionally, but also for his family who was traumatized and who had actually watched him be arrested. However, the prosecution abruptly dropped all four, four charges against Dr. Chen, concluding that they could no longer meet the burden of proof at trial. And prosecutors even admitted that the indictment had been rushed. He later on received a personal apology, but not an official apology <laughs> from the Department of uh, Justice uh, staffer. Now, despite his experience, which you think would make many people uh, not want to contribute or continue to work in their research, uh, Dr. Gong Cheng continued to uh, innovate and actually his team went on to find a new semiconductor material that would make the United States even more competitive on a global scale. He is an example of the sort of talent we would have lost in our country had we continued to push in the wrong direction. Then we have Dr. Amin Hu, and his case is very important because he was the first academic to go to trial and finish all the, before the China Initiative had ended. He's a professor at the University of Tennessee, and the government had essentially relied on questionable tactics and continued to pursue a case against him even after they found no evidence of espionage. His case actually highlights how any nexus to China could potentially get you in trouble. And the attempt that the DOJ was using in essentially criminalizing ordinary behaviors. Now, he eventually won. Um, but following his acquittal, it was a long journey for him to be reinstated by his university. He was also a green card holder, ironically from Canada. And so his wife keeps bothering him why he like Canada for the United States. Um, but he eventually got his green card uh, approved. But throughout the whole process, there was a family impact. It was not only him that was being surveilled by the FBI, but also his son, who was a college student. And of course, that impacted his son's status here in the United States. So it's very important to look at these sort of cases, recognize how important it was that we were able to win them and the consequences and implications for that for the China Initiative. Now, it was a very critical, obviously racial profiling did not start with the initiative, but it was a very critical step forward because before we can handle many of these administrative issues, we had to decriminalize uh, many of these normal academic activities. If we are coming to a decision that somehow any relationship with China, any <laughs> engagement with Chinese nationals is something to be criminalized, that, that is a different story. But we can't have people getting in trouble because they went to a conference in China because they have family members in China and they visited and they forgot to fill out our paperwork or it was unclear from the paperwork that somehow these sort of engagements are something that needs to be disclosed. So we are very concerned that we see efforts 
like the recent vote here with the House, and we'll look to see how that's going to be addressed in the Senate, whether they'll take it up or whether that's something that will be put to the side. But we have the second bill that many of you may be familiar with, which is the must-pass appropriations bill. And the China Initiative reinstatement is also in that bill. So you can imagine that for many of the families, there is no moving forward when time and time again, Congress is trying to bring back this initiative that has largely been <laughs> recognized as ineffective and leads to discriminatory practices, whether intended or unintended. So I'll leave it there so that my colleagues can share some of the stories and I look forward to um, questions from the audience. Thank you, Janella. I'm going to quickly, quickly ask you the, appro um, the appropriations bill you said. So if the uh, the bill that specifically reinstates the China initiative under the name of the CCP initiative, if that's not passed in the Senate, the appropriations bill has a sufficient language that that would reinstate the program. Yes, so we, we're actually facing it on multiple fronts. Okay. Uh, there's been multiple attempts to bring back the China yes. initiative. So the, the CCP um, bill is a standalone bill. So even if we win and it doesn't get through the Senate, right. we still have the appropriations right. bill, which for many of you, because it's a must-pass bill, it's actually considered a more priority bill for us. Right. Um, I'll give the exact number. It'll, it'll provide about over $78 billion and included in those funds is essentially a mandate to reestablish the China initiative. Uh, mind you, this is forcing funding on a department that conducted their own internal investigation and came to the conclusion that the China initiative was not the right approach. Great. Um, oh, not great. <laughs> thank you for those great remarks. Uh, Dr. Shu. Oh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank the uh, uh, US Asia Law Institute uh, for this opportunity to talk my experience and the lesson that I learned from this experience. Um, as Catherine mentioned, um, I was uh, falsely charged by the US government in 2015. That's uh, three years before the China initiative. And uh, so what happened is uh, in, a, in the morning uh, of May uh, 2015, uh, then the FBI agents um, not raided my house. Uh, you know, they knocked on my door. And uh, when I opened, I saw about a dozen agents there. <coughs> uh, some of them are armed and uh, two guys with the batting ram next to my door. And, uh, so they, uh, you know, uh, just uh, asked my name and uh, arrest me uh, on the spot and uh, put handcuffs on me. And uh, so that was a huge shock because uh, there was absolutely no indication that something like that would happen. And, and, and then they, uh, you know, the uh, FBI agents, they had their gun uh, drawn and uh, running about uh, to yell, FBI, FBI, and then uh, I two daughters and uh, my wife, both, uh, all of them were at home. Uh, so they were ordered uh, to raise their hands, walk out of the uh, bedroom. And uh, so they uh, just run them up together um, and, and took me away in handcuffs. And uh, that I actually asked them, well, why, why I was arrested and they wouldn't come saying that go to uh, our uh, field office, ask, answer some questions and then uh, we'll tell you. So they took me to the FBI field office in Philadelphia. Um, they interrogated me for two hours. Uh, actually, I you know I, I know enough that I shouldn't talk uh, without a lawyer, but but I don't know. Uh, I didn't know why they were arresting me. <clears throat> I, I was chair of the department, so I said, well, you know, I, I talked very carefully. Uh, but after two hours, they will still not tell me, and uh, I keep asking, and they say, well. Uh, you are uh, charged for uh, sharing uh, U.S. company technology with uh, uh, people in China. And, and immediately I said, that's absurd. Uh, and then I kept quiet. <laughs> and, uh, and because I knew that's, that's not possible, uh, because I never did it. And uh, so they, they charged me for sharing uh, a technology called Pocket Heater, with my collaborators in China based on four emails that I sent from my company university address. 
And uh, the, uh, uh, as I said, I, I, I never did it. And uh, also that technology was uh, widely open. And uh, so um, it, it was very hard because uh, as a physicist, you know, I had absolutely no experience is how to deal with the situation. So I had to learn uh, how to find a lawyer, which is not easy. And uh, I had to figure out how uh, was I going to pay for all this. Uh, I actually was, you know, uh, uh, ready to uh, sell properties and uh, borrow money, uh, just so whatever it takes. I, I was determined to find a good lawyer and uh, win it because if I had lost, my whole life, my whole career will be in uh, Germany. And uh, so, you know, fortunately, I had a team of uh, great lawyers. And we, uh, so it, it turns out that my email was, uh, we're talking about something completely different from this uh, topic here. And uh, to the FBI agents, they just, you know, they, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the inventor of this uh, puppy heater had told the FBI agents that my email had nothing to do with that. And they still went ahead and charged me. So uh, we have contacted the uh, top experts in my field uh, to provide affidavits. We gave them all my emails with my Chinese, Chinese colleagues. And uh, so they provide the affidavit saying that all this email had nothing to do with this popping heater. They were all about the technology that Dr. C uh, invented in, he developed in his own lab. And uh, so my lawyer uh, made a presentation to the, uh, uh, the prosecutor and the FBI agents, and we prepared a, uh, a motion to dis uh, dis um, dismiss the uh, indictment, and we actually gave the government uh, a uh, draft. Uh, in the motion, obviously, we listed all the wrongdoings that the, uh, the, the FBI agents had, had committed. And uh, all the the the, the, the uh, all, all the, the this this untruth they told uh, the grand jury and so on and so forth. And so um, the uh, after that the, the government decided to drop the case. So uh, there are some lessons that I learned from this. Three lessons. Number one, uh, what the government said uh, when they charge people for crime is not necessarily true. Right. Before that, you know, of course, I was just like everybody else and thinking that if they charge somebody, that it must be true or some facts in that. Totally not true in my case. Second lesson, uh, Chinese scientists are being uh, treated unfairly. And the third, uh, they are criminalizing academic exchanges. Unfortunately, after my case, all these three lessons have been proven true. Again and again, uh, as Ms. Sala talked about, this China initiative, all these cases, you know, all these China initiative cases uh, involving professors uh, in, in the university, none of them have stolen any intellectual properties uh, and transferred it to China. None of them. You know, they are charged for uh, land disclosure and so on and so forth. Uh, but that, that, you know, that they are just. Uh, inventing something uh, to to go after the Chinese uh, uh, scientists. The uh, the uh, the reason you know when I uh, since then I've been following all these cases, and uh, the root cause for all these problems are not because uh, that the FBI agents do not understand science. That's not the reason. Uh, the root cause was because. They think uh, all these Chinese scientists, professors, and students are spies for China. And uh, they have a name for, for them. It's called uh, a non traditional collective. The FBI agents uh, came in front of the uh, Congress and saying that there's a slew of non traditional collectors uh, who are not trained professionally. You know, the academics, professors, students, businessmen. Uh, they are all for uh, one reason or the other how China, uh, Chinese government to collect information. And uh, so in my time, actually, uh, my case happened in 2015. There was uh, several cases then. Uh, the, uh, uh, my case 
and Sherry Chen space. Uh, that's a, a hydrologist in uh, uh, weather service. And there are a case of uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, engineers from Eli Lilly. They, we were all charged for like stealing something for China. And all those cases were turned out to be untrue and dropped. And afterwards, the FBI kind of passed for a couple of years. And then, you know, it started this China initiative and started to charge people for that discussion. And, uh, and of course, uh, as uh, Sarah mentioned, the, the Hanim Hu's case, uh, and, and the judge actually completely, uh, you know, uh, destroyed uh, DOJ's theory about these people, uh, the crime, you know, and this culture. Plus, uh, you know, these the scientists did whatever uh, the government wanted to do, so there's no fraud. And the rule of the disclosure was not clear. So you, you cannot, you know, you cannot charge people uh, if you don't have clear uh, uh, rules because they don't know uh, that they need to do this and that. So uh, now, um, what is uh, the DOJ going to do next? Uh, we don't really know. And uh, there are these, uh, there are these uh, DOJ established a disruptive technology task force. And uh, the, the, the uh, uh, mission of that task force is to investigate and uh, prosecute uh, violations of export control rules. Uh, we haven't seen cases uh, about that, but you know they have a task force. I'm sure they're going to do something. And of course, we've seen a few cases about being an agent of Chinese government without registering. Um, maybe that's something because uh, whoever you know uh, are interacting with uh, with the embassy consulate and doing something maybe getting a, a salt duck or whatever, uh, <laughs> salt duck, duck uh, maybe that's, you know, they can be uh, justified as a, as an agent. Uh, we don't know, but um, I better wrap up, but uh, uh, before my case, there was a case out of uh, NYU, an engineering professor uh, who uh, has some uh, collaboration in China, he was charged and he pleaded guilty for not disclosing a patent he had before he came here to the university. And that uh, plead as a misdemeanor of a uh, uh, false statement. At that time, I was saying, saying oh, well, you know, for, uh, filling a form uh, with some error could be charged for crime, for a misdemeanor. And then later on, we, we, we found out that that can be a, a felony charge. And so we don't know what's going to be uh, invited to next. Uh, but, but the point I'm saying is, as long as they think Chinese scientists, students uh, are, are uh, spies, this is going to continue. Mm -hmm. Sorry to add that. Thank you very much. It's a sober story, and we'll come back and have more questions for you. So, Jessica. Thanks, Catherine. And just again, I'm so honored to be on um, this panel with Gisela and Dr. Shi. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of background about my own work and kind of bring another level of um, context to the conversation. So as Catherine mentioned, I work at the National Committee on US-China Relations, um, a nonpartisan nonprofit that was established in 1966, so even prior to the formal establishment of diplomatic relations with the PRC. Um, my portfolio is mainly government engagement, so I work to put together briefings and workshops for uh, congressional staffers, members of Congress, state and local government officials, and then also more recently um, putting together briefings for the FBI, um, both HQ and various field offices around the country. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that work and then talk more about some of the general trends I'm seeing in my own work when it comes to China and US-China relations um, and the direct effect that has on anti-Asian racism and xenophobia. Um, so basically, I think it's important to recognize that um, the agents and analysts in the field offices that we work with are typically kind of jacks and jills of all trade. Um, they have limited knowledge of China and US-China relations. 
Um, one day they might be working on a domestic terrorism case, the next day um, it could be something China related. So there's a really broad scope of working issues that they come across. Obviously, um, the learning curve is steep. Um, U.S.-China relations has become much more complicated, and China has changed substantially under Xi Jinping. Um, they've been able to, China uh, and Xi Jinping um, has been able to deepen the playbook. They're operating with much more uh, sophistication and resources, especially when it comes to transnational repression and influence. And this is obviously done through social media and digitization and a variety of other uh, platforms. And then on the U.S. side, um, foreign policy and domestic policy are increasingly intertwined. Things that maybe 10 or 15 years ago would be seen purely as more of a foreign policy issue. Um, that's no longer the case. I think national security and economic security and competitiveness um, have been um, intrinsically um, woven together. And um, you can see that from uh, the legislation that Gisela mentioned um, being proposed on the Hill this week for China Week, which we can talk a bit more about. So basically, um, the role of the National Committee has been to bring in experts and connect uh, agents and analysts to these experts um, to talk about issues and concepts that may help, we hope, um, will help better inform their work. So basically, our role has been conveners. We're not an advocacy organization. Um, I'm not there to tell the FBI how to do their counterintelligence work. Um, our work is much more about adding layers of nuance to the discussion and also helping them to better understand big picture context. So we've been looking at this as um, we really think it's important to help them better understand the drivers of potential behavior and activity that they're seeing in the United States. So looking at what's happening in China in the political space, the economic space, um, and civil society and general social space. So looking at the anti-corruption campaign, um, learning more about the tightening of civil society under Xi Jinping and why that's been happening, the state of China's economy, why is there an emphasis on indigenous innovation and China becoming a global leader in high tech? Um, what is you know, the idea of national rejuvenation? Um, reasons behind the history behind China's core interest in red lines. All of this is to say, I think you need to understand a lot of the big picture issues um, and history of the relationship and how China has changed since opening reform um, to be able to even begin to look at a case um, and know kind of the different influences and strands that could be um, at play. I think it's also important to keep in mind when you're looking at the field offices, um, there are different concerns and focuses around different parts of the country. You look at Silicon Valley and maybe the field office in San Francisco, there's a lot more um, interest in AI, tech, and, and IP protection. If you look at maybe Boston, there's a lot of interest in uh, pharma, biotech. But I'd say across the board, um, there's a definite interest in the uptick in transnational repression. And uh, the FBI knows it's in their interest to uh, better understand both um, Chinese diaspora communities um, and um, populations where there's higher concentrations of Chinese nationals. In preparing for this, and we discussed, you know, are there any common misconceptions that I can come across in my work? And I would say not really. Um, so far, I can say maybe we've engaged with around 100 different agents and analysts. That's really a small number if you think about the fact that there's 55 different field offices around the country. Um, but I'd say not just in our engagement with the FBI, it could be on the Hill or people at the state and local level. I think there are a couple of issues that are not being looked at with enough nuance. I'd say one, um, looking at student, Chinese students and scholars in the United States, I think there is very little understanding about um, maybe how uh, the students who first came over in the 80s versus students today. I mean, I've had people say, well, the Chinese government is paying for those students, all those students to come over, right? No, that's actually, that's not the case. Um, and if that's how you're operating, obviously you would think that uh, you could potentially question the students and scholars' loyalties. Um, another layer, I think, looking at students um, and scholars in the US, the issue of Chinese students and scholars associations that are on a lot of campuses. Um, I don't think there's enough thought about looking at the different reasons for why a student would join a CSSA when they're on campus. It's not 
because they want to, uh, you know, be connected necessarily to the Chinese consulate and receive resources, resources, uh, resources. I mean, there's there's reasons uh, why the CSSA exists on campus. Outside of that, um, it's a social network. It's used for networking. It's how people find jobs. It's how people get connected to one another. Another misconception I think would be this idea of the CCP and you throw the CCP being thrown around on the Hill. Um, you know, the CCP has over 90 million members. I think it's, you know, safe to say that all 90 million people haven't joined for the same reason. Um, when you're a vice principal or a principal at a middle school or a high school in China, in order to be, get those jobs, you have to join the party. Um, I've met many of them before, people in those types of roles, and they're not joining because of their loyalty to Xi Jinping. They're doing it because they want to get a better job at the school and be able to provide more for their family. So um, obviously, you know, these are big kind of big picture issues that you would need to tease out. Um, but I think if you're not a China specialist or a scholar in US-China relations, you don't necessarily have the tools or connections to experts to think about those things. Um, but I'll just, again, reiterate that um, from my work, um, there is a great interest in better understanding uh, Chinese diaspora communities in the US and the different motivations and reasons um, for why people have come to the United States. I think beginning to recognize that um, Chinese nationals and Chinese Americans have different opinions about Xi Jinping and the Chinese government, very much the same way uh, Americans and other uh, ethnic minority groups who live in the United States would have about the US government. Um, and there are different levels of loyalty to the US and their support for the US government. Um, this is not um, you know, any different for a Chinese national or a Chinese American. Um, there's also a lot of different levels, I think, or layers that go into uh, better understanding um, a Chinese national or a Chinese American in the US. Whether you've had your education in the PRC, whether you've had your education in the US, whether you were born in the PRC versus Taiwan versus Hong Kong, these all add different layers of nuance that I think we need to better explore um, and um, better understand. And again, um, I don't know the future of the reinstating of the just of the China Initiative, um, but I do. I can say that uh, the people who have I engaged with at the FBI. Um, very much are interested in developing a more nuanced understanding and recognize the importance of better understanding China and US-China relations. Um, so there is that motivation there. And I'm happy to talk more about any of that and during the Q&A. Um, and before I turn to the Q&A, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the themes that Gisela has already talked about. Um, obviously, I think we're all aware of the increasing securitization of all things China-related. And I think it's clear when talking to policymakers and other people with influence that um, there is a cost and we need to make sure that whether it's economic, social, educational, um, you know, af affecting our research and innovative capacity, that there is a cost and we need to be clear eyed about them moving forward. Um, obviously, you know, um, more scientists of Chinese origin are considering to leave the United States or have already left. Um, many of them, is, there's been a major reduction in the application of federal grants, and there's a real cost there in terms of how we're able to best compete moving forward. Um, in terms of the legislation put forth during China Week, which I think, Giselle, I'd love for you to talk about during the Q&A, how it, that name in itself is problematic, um, there will be costs, um, whether it's the Biosecure Act, and you're looking at you know, potential reductions and um, ability to collaborate, do clinical trials, costs of drugs increasing, um, and obviously uh, increased xenophobia and anti and Asian racism and profiling. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that many of these proposals um, that have made it onto the floor this week are purely political. I mean, you could look at the news, there's quotes, because the White House has chosen not to confront China and protect America's interests, House Republicans will. Um, and even uh, Rep. Krishnamurthy, who is the co-chair of the Select Committee on the CCP, um, he has said that, you know, China weak is actually pretty weak, W-E-A-K on China. Um, so even people within the Select Committee are kind of questioning um, the motivations behind some of the legislation we've seen this week. 
Um, I think I'm going to stop there because I want to leave um, more time for Q&A and I'm happy to delve more into some of these topics. Um, but I guess I, it's my prerogative perhaps to start with the first um, question. So I wanted to ask Gisela what you think we could be done um, to, approve, to improve risk assessment and the identification of risk factors when it comes to looking at these cases. How can we approach um, identifying actual instances of potential espionage in a more um, holistic and uh, productive way? And then for Dr. Xi, I wanted to ask um, how we can best address the fear of Chinese origin scientists and make the American academic environment more welcoming and attractive to them moving forward, whether that's policy, whether that's advocacy, um, as as we know, Chinese scientists are essential to the innovative capacity in the US and we need them here in the United States in order to truly compete with China moving forward. Well, well, thank you, Jessica. I'll, I'll pick on the first question and I wanna first add the caveat that Asian American scholar form is first and foremost a domestic civil rights organization. Um, if these issues did not have such severe domestic consequences on Americans and immigrants here at home, um, we would not be engaging in many of these issues. But as you can see, and why we have this uh, fellowship program uh, with the U.S. Uh, China Law Institute, we have needed as a domestic um, space, not just for ASF, but within the whole civil rights community, to have more U.S. China experts and more legal scholars to engage in these efforts. So I would say one of the first steps, of course, in figuring out how should we be tackling risk um, it shouldn't be on the civil rights community to um, let educate the FBI on how they should be handling things, but we do have a responsibility to protect our communities when we see how some of these assessments could be potentially infringing on the rights of Americans and immigrants here at home. I think there is a lot of legal scholarship that needs to still develop on the question of how we should be addressing risk in our country, but also what are some of the legal questions, right? If this is not just the prosecutions under the China Initiative, but if US students are looking to work for the federal government, when they do their screening of you, what is actually appropriate for them to look at? Um, what does it mean when you speak multiple language? What does it mean when you have grandparents abroad? Do you want to be judged on certain things that are inherent qualities or things that you cannot change? You can't change your ethnicity, you can't change where your family comes from. Maybe you could have told your parents, I wish you never forced me to go to Japanese school or Chinese school over the weekend. But these are really critical questions that we actually need attorneys to address. Um, bring it forward to the national security space and ask them and, and actually push back. You know, I spoke um, with one of the ACLU attorneys that represented Sherry Chen that Xiaoxing mentioned, and she had won the largest settlement against the Department of Commerce in its history. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we, we joked about was, because I, I think not as many of the scholars understood, but there's nothing more American than criticizing the government. Um, and attorneys are very good at criticizing, and we just need more of you in this space playing a very critical role. So I think that is very critical. The other part that I think is really important um, in relation to the risk assessment is, of course, the, the biggest question on espionage. Um, we need more legal scholars to address this idea of how espionage and this definition has evolved over time, right? Before it was very clear. You have this physical espionage, there's a foreign country, and you are a foreign agent working for that. It expanded to economic espionage. And now it's expanded to this concept of non-traditional collectors that Dr. Xi had mentioned. And there are a couple of questions that the legal community should be asking about this concept of non-traditional collectors. Because it includes the fact that you don't have to intend to commit espionage. You don't have to have any ill intent. You don't need to be a foreign agent. You could just be a normal student studying in the United States, and then you went back home, and somehow, potentially, you could be considered a non-traditional collector. These overbroad concepts of how risky behavior is being addressed does have serious consequences for the Asian American community. I think it's very important to recognize 
that we are a predominantly immigrant community. Many of us came here as first generation. I was born in the Philippines. I came here and immigrated to the United States. These sort of backgrounds should not be criminalized. And I, I do want to add, because I didn't have a chance to share, this is not just something for the professors. This is something that's impacting how legislation is being held across the board. We see alien land laws across the country in different states that is restricting who can be landowners. This should be very familiar. And unfortunately, we're facing it in the modern day. There's a bill in Florida that would restrict graduate students coming from China conducting research. We have a proclamation from during the Trump administration that essentially has resulted in many students reaching out to me where they were approved by the State Department to come study in the United States, but then rejected at the border and were no longer able to continue their studies. There are many silent cases that is essentially hurting the pipeline for not just future Asian American innovators, but future Asian American citizens, period. If we are hurting this immigration pipeline in our country, we are going to see less diversity in our universities, less diversity in our scientific and academic space. And the last point I want to add, because there's so much scrutiny on the Asian American scholar, scientific and academic community specifically, that there is a great irony in this because many of these scholars had actually been persecuted under the cultural Chinese Cultural Revolution. They came from a long line of professors. We have one of our members, for example, where when he was a child, the Red Guard had actually gone through his home. These are the experiences that they had not being accepted in by the PRC, by the CCP, and coming to the United States with a hope for a better life where they could conduct and follow their dreams in freedom. We often don't see that narrative because the popular narrative is that somehow people of Chinese descent are just the same as the CCP. And we need to make sure we have a clear separation. Okay, um, I'll answer the question about uh, what can be done to improve the environment so that uh, Chinese scientists feel uh, welcome. Um, my answer is you can't. You can't. Uh, because as I said, uh, the government thinks uh, these uh, Chinese uh, academics, professors, students are uh, spies, right? not traditional collectors. And, um, you know, uh, we used to hear uh, the uh, IPI director talk about non traditional collectors and officials from uh, DOJ talk about that. And this is bill uh, that just passed the House uh, CCP initiative. Uh, there are this language, I can read it for you. Uh, to, to establish the CCP initiative, one of the, uh, the one of uh, what they should do is to develop an enforcement strategy concerning non-traditional collectors, including researchers in, lab, in labs, universities, and the defense industry base that are being used to transfer technology contrary to the United States interests. So it's not just DOJ talking about non-traditional collectors, it's the, uh, the members of the Congress talking about non-traditional collectors. So uh, as long as we are considered uh, non-traditional collectors, uh, uh, this, this hostile environment is going to continue. And by the way, uh, there are not going to be people like me uh, who come from China in the future. Right? So the number two person, uh, Kurt uh, Campbell from the Department of uh, State has said very publicly, we don't want, uh, the, we want Chinese students, but we should not stop. We want them to come here to study humanity and social science, not particle physics, and they want uh, uh, more Indian students to come to the United States to study STEM, not Chinese students. So uh, if you don't have uh, STEM students uh, coming from China, uh, you're not going to have uh, professors and, uh, and uh, researchers. Uh, and I will say, you know, you will not have uh, engineers uh, in our companies that will come from China. So, it's going to be uh, very difficult for, for people uh, of Chinese uh, descent. 
And if I can just add something to what Dr. Shi mentioned, um, I want to make it very clear that, um, you know, by no means are we against appropriate measures to safeguard the United States. It's just that many of these measures are very lazy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to lift up um, a recent National Academy of Science uh, and Engineering and Medicine report. Um, this is an institution that is very well respected in the scientific community. Many go on to become Nobel laureates in our country. Um, and they have indicated essentially their recommendations, which includes working towards talent recruitment, making sure that the United States continues to attract the best and brightest talents across the country. And this includes making sure that we don't have a chilling effect on the Asian American community. And I also want to lift up one of their recommendations, that this is a scientific organization. They don't like to engage in this part of the work. But one of the things they mentioned was that the priority should be ensuring uh, compliance with uh, applicable federal funding agencies and institutional policies rather than prosecution. The idea that we should be actually working on how our policies are being conducted, the administrative aspects, instead of this sort of deterrence approach of, well, if we arrest and in prosecute enough scientists, maybe US-China collaboration will stop. That we should actually veer more towards, how can we actually make the United States more competitive? And we are fortunate enough that making the United States more competitive means aligning with our American values that has attracted so many talents. I'll give an example. The United States does not have the best talents in AI. We need immigration to essentially poach AI talents from the PRC. And we were very successful. Many AI talents wanted to remain in the United States. But then when you have efforts like the China Initiative, where just by working in AI, you could potentially be subject to heightened scrutiny, that creates a very unwelcoming environment, and we're in danger of losing the very talents that could help us win in this competition. Can I, can I just add a couple of okay. One minute. Uh, we'll get so, questions. So I, 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 I'm just trying to say that uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, interactions with uh, Chinese scientists, uh, and I think uh, the policy of the government is pretty clear. Uh, they don't do anything, right? In Chips and Science Act, there are specific provisions listing things that you should not do. And then if you read it, pretty much you shouldn't do anything. And uh, right now, the uh, federal agents, the one they talk about uh, international collaboration, where they are talking about uh, with like-minded countries, mm -hmm. not countries of concern, right? China, Iran, uh, Russia, and North Korea. And uh, so I, I think what we need to worry about is to be defensive so that when war uh, broke out, uh, we will not be sent to internal tests. And that's our concern right now. That's a dark vision. Uh, so, yes, we want to go to questions now, both online and in the room. And I see a hand on the please, sir. Okay. Um, so my name is David Spine, and uh, I've worked on this issue for a long time. Um, and I, and uh, one thing that I often don't hear discussed, I remember I was on the committee, I was part of the, the I wrote a paper on China for the uh, NASB, for the National the, the, uh, Report of the, um, the what about lightning for the <laughs> National Academy. Um, but uh, Yashan gave the talk too, yeah. and, and it's uh, Yashan Huang. And, and one thing that doesn't get the attention that I think it should, and from what I was here, I didn't hear, is 70, Section 702. That's how they got you, right? That's how they found you. They found you because the United States Intelligence Service collects 1.8 billion emails a month and then scrubs those emails. And then if it finds that there is any kind of communication, they can do it worldwide, but any kind of communication between the Chinese scholar in China, the Chinese scholar in the United States, and they can say it's national security, then they can go and investigate you without a writ. They don't have to go to court. That, to me, is the biggest reason why people stop doing research. That's, and that's the strategy. 
the strategy of the U.S. intelligence service is to stop collaboration. And 702 is the best proof more than anything else, you know, more than kicking down your door or, you know, falsely accusing people. It's the discovery of people who they then go and can attack. That is, is the real problem. And 702 got we approved, right? Uh, so Congress can do all at once about some of this stuff. And I, I don't disagree with you that there's all kinds of limitations that are put on, you know, behavior um, and collaboration. But it always strikes me that you should say more about 702, right? And that everybody should be talking about 702 because that's really, that's the death knell of collaborative research, right? That's why people don't want to do collaborative research because they're going to get investigated. Even if they didn't do anything wrong, if someone is sitting in an FBI office gets that email, right? Scrubs the emails and finds the word like your pocket eater, right? They probably found something about the pocket eater in the, in the email or something, you know, whatever. And that gave them the right to investigate you without going to court. No, I agree with you. 702 is a, is a, um, it, it's a serious problem. I mean, uh, every every uh, American citizen could be surveyed on if you are talking with your parents, friends uh, in China. And uh, so that is a problem. Uh, but, but I think that the, 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 the fundamental problem, as I said, is, uh, you know, it's a very simple logic. Why should we help uh, out the, an enemy uh, country to train their uh, scientists? And, and, and that's, I think, uh, where all these uh, start. Uh, so that's why they want to stop it, as you said. And uh, to me, it's very clear. They, they just want to stop anything that can help Chinese government. So I want to just for anybody here who may not know what 702 is, this is a, a provision in the Foreign Surveillance Act. And Foreign Intelligence. Uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, yes, thank you. And um, it was just, uh, so I just checked to see where we were because it's been renewed every few years for the last 20 plus years since it was first legislated. And it was just renewed most recently in April. And so it's very much... I'm supporting that. 55 Asian American organizations wrote mm -hmm. letters yeah. to you. Yeah. Right, I think if anybody thinks there is privacy, uh, you know, just forget about it. <laughs> and, and I will add that, um, you know, our colleagues at the ACLU and Brennan Center have been working on that for a decade. This is an issue for all Americans. Um, and it, it's actually thanks to Dr. Xiaoxing Xi that the Asian American community was able to become engaged um, because his case made it so much more public, right? Um, and it's a testament to how actually going through the whole litigation process could make a big impact uh, because we do find out more, more detail. It was very challenging for us to find stories that could go out publicly because as David mentioned, it, it's so insidious. You know, how do you even know that you're being surveilled, right? How do you know that you're your privacy, um, it, it, you're, you're being watched. You know when they kick down the door. <laughs> you know they kick down the door. <laughs> uh, um, first, I'm, I'm intrigued. I learned about non-traditional collectors, a new term of art. Uh, I, I, I believe I, uh, Ms. Kusakawa's discussion of the Japanese internment I think it might be good to point out that this discussion of country of origin, which is a, a, a phrase that I'm afraid I don't like, because the country of origin of many of the Japanese, the, the, many of the people incarcerated was Oakland, California, the Imperial Valley. I mean, it, the country of origin is the United States for many of these people. And I think that has to be emphasized. The other, the, the other is a much broader question. Catherine said at the beginning, and, and I believe uh, Ms. Kusakawa noted, and then the gentleman over there noted that there are real security threats. That China's going to take over a few more islands in the South China Sea? I mean, what, compared to what Russia is doing, compared to 
the, the security threat of the Cold War. Uh, what is this horrendous security threat that is looming that everybody says, well, we have to be very cautious because, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of the security threat. Of course, there's competition. I assume that we're spying on China. We certainly are going to be spying on Germany and Israel and India. If we weren't spying on China, I'd like to know, you know, somebody's dropping the ball somewhere. So what is the special security threat that that China poses? I have some thoughts. <laughs> um, no, I um, think you bring up the, a good point. I think it's it's not um, the same type of Cold War security threat that we faced in terms of nuclear annihilation, even though China is building up its um, nuclear power. I think it's more of this notion that there is potentially a country out there who's going to be better at us in certain things. And it's this idea that for, I think, many Americans who are still alive, the U.S. has always been the hegemon. And what does it mean if we're not anymore? So in other words, it's the same kind of hysteria about in the 80s about, the, about Japan. I think so. Um, but this time, it's with a country where the government is... Um, not a, not, a not a democracy. The word communism is very triggering for, I think, a lot of people. And I'm not saying that there aren't inherently abhorrent practices that are happening in China and through transnational repression that have been brought about by the CCP. I'm not saying that. But I think it's this existential notion that at some point there might be a country that is beating us in some category that we deem important. And they are not like us. And the values and their government is very different from our own. And I think that is very uncomfortable and very scary for a lot of people. So it's hysteria. Yeah. I, I and that there are actual, I think there are attempts. Which, that, which is a real emotion, by the yeah. way. Uh, and I think that Dr. Xi's experience certainly would have made me, you know, you open the door and you see. Right. But I think if you look at China's growing military and what that could mean in the South China Sea, what that could mean for Taiwan. Um, that's a, a true legitimate security threat for our allies and partners in East Asia. I think that's legitimate as well. I mean, China's behavior has changed under Xi Jinping and they've become much more aggressive in their foreign policy. They're growing their military, their offensive capabilities have grown exponentially. Um, so I think those are real as well, but I think there is this underlying at least in my, my opinion, that it's hard for some Americans to accept the idea that we are not, we may not be number one in everything moving forward. I'd, I'd like to just jump in and say there's also the, the fact that China in recent years has set itself up as an alternative uh, leader yeah. on the world stage. And so it deliberately and, and repeatedly whether it's the UN or other venues, rallies other countries against US policies internationally. So a threat doesn't have to mean always a uh, hot war. There are also other, other ways of undermining US foreign policy. So that is what that is what our policymakers and strategic and national security people are thinking about when they talk about threat. It's not just uh, the fear of being number two. I think, I think there's, some, there's more tangible things there than the fear of being number two. Um, but none of us in here are national security experts, so I think we should acknowledge that um, and see a hand in the mirror. Yeah, thank you all so much um, for this conversation. Uh, my name is Lloyd Fang, and I work for an Asian American nonprofit based in New York City, but today I'm you know, coming in a personal capacity. Um, so, you know, you clearly laid out there's a lot of threats, right, that pose to certain segments of our communities, right? Um, what do we do, right? Obviously, there's advocacy that you're doing. Now, I think that we're obviously in a position where, um, you know, we don't necessarily have as much support as we want, or we think from a moral perspective, we should have more support, right? There's bipartisan anti-China sentiment. Some of it very legitimate, right? I'm an American first. I'm Chinese American. I was born here. My parents came here in the 80s. Um, on those, uh, like, uh, he says that H.W. Bush put out there right after the Tiananmen uh, incident massacre. Um, 
But like, what do we do, right? There's there, there are legitimate potential concerns, and maybe it's up to us and the government to decide what legitimate it is. But like, we're going to some case that you alluded to, right? When you're a state government, an official who has these weird ties to you know the, the consulate, right? I, as a New Yorker, as a Chinese American, do not like what this is. Like, I, I don't want to see officials that have a potential tie to China to CCP. I don't know what that is, right? Gives me a bad name. Gives my parents a bad name. Gives my grandma a bad name. I don't want that. So, like, is there a posture that we can take that is more? Again, I, I understand this is complicated. I don't want us to have to prove our loyalty, um, but we can't just keep taking the standing down and, and you know keep pushing. I think not. Okay, we're not <laughs> taking standing down, of course. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that everybody's done, but like, what else can we do, right? In a way that is more proactive, demonstrating that we are Americans too. Uh, I recall, like with Iranian Americans, right after the um, Islamist takeover of their country, there were Iranian Americans here, right, who decided they had to take a different posture, right? They had they are even more anti-Iran than like the than the Tom Cotton types in Congress, right? I don't necessarily see that from our feelings, right? Like it, it sucks. It really does suck, right? Because it feels like we're between a rock and a hard spot. But even like legitimate criticism of the Chinese government or Xi Jinping, right? Like from Chinese Americans, I don't really hear that. I hear people during COVID and other Asian Americans saying any criticism of China is illegitimate, right? Or Democrats walking around potential legitimate criticisms of the Chinese government for fear of inciting the anti Asian hate here, right? Or legitimizing what we feel like, like Republicans using China as a cudgel against Asians here. It's really tricky. Like I'm the way I'm talking about it is it's so tricky, right? I, I recognize that, but like, what what else is there for us to do? Yeah, if, if I can add, I think that's a question so many within the Asian American community have. I think first, it's really important that Asian Americans know that they're not responsible for any actions or reputation of a foreign government just because they're statured um, heritage, and also understanding that. We have gone past the point of compensation. Um, there was a time when you know Japanese Americans would not want to speak Japanese. They would try to come off as American or whatever they envisioned to be American. Don't teach your children this foreign language. Try to blend in. Um, but we've gone past that. You know, we don't need to hide how we eat, what food we eat in order to belong. Asian American culture is a part of American culture. Um, and so I think that is really important because of course there are a lot of foreign tensions between Asian countries abroad. I am Filipino American married to a Japanese citizen. My brother uh, is married to someone who is Chinese American. The solidarity that the Asian American community had came from the bow because we have shared persecution and discrimination in this country, because we are perceived to be a monolith. When you think about the hate crimes that were happening against the Asian American community, it included elderly Filipinos in New York who were mistaken to be of Chinese descent. And so there needed to be this solidarity work, there needed to be a separation from all the tensions and conflicts happening abroad with the future that we're creating here in the United States. In terms of solutions, it's not just the policy, it's also the history work. One of the things we're doing at ASF is working towards the creation of the first National Asian Pacific American Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC, to illustrate how Asian Americans have been such a fundamental part of American history. I'll give an example. Right now, we're doing Zoom calls. You know, how many people know that the algorithm that is widely used for Zoom video calls is by an Asian American. Or the ability for you to save your video games um, is by a Chinese American. You know, these are invisible history of Asian Americans that perpetuates this narrative that we are not American, that we have not contributed to this country, and that we don't have a state in this country. So I would encourage many Asian Americans to work with us towards raising this invisible history because that will make it less likely for us to be so easily scapegoated in the future. Because for the most part, we have largely been a footnote in this country in terms of how it's been shaped and formed, despite the fact we've been so fundamental in so many of the 
strides that the United States has been able to make. And in terms of just some of the legitimate concerns with the CCP, it, obviously in my professional capacity, in my nonprofit, I can't speak as much on the international issues. But of course, in my personal capacity, having worked with so many humanitarian issues and civil rights issues, I'm concerned with any regime in the world who persecutes and targets their own people and people abroad. That includes the CCP, what's happening abroad there, includes Russia. But I think what's really critical is the implementation of some of these policies and rhetoric in the United States. The DOJ never had a Russia initiative in its history. The China initiative was the first time they had an initiative in that other country. We saw language like the China virus. I know it doesn't make sense, but the average person hears China virus and they think this virus came from the Chinese people. We need to, they're the reason why COVID-19 happened. And that's what led to so many hate crimes and violence. And so we urge many of our policymakers to be cognizant of human behaviors and reactions and be mindful of the language that they use. So instead of China virus, using something that's a little less country specific, um, that ultimately is going to help ensure Asian Americans are more protected and aren't targeted for any hate crimes or discrimination. So Gisela, I'm hearing you say one of the solutions, or not solutions, but the one of the steps toward a solution is to develop robust counter narratives um, and robust messaging from the Chinese American and Asian American community. Um, there was another thing that we were talking about the other day when we were discussing this, and that was about just ensuring that when uh, the FBI or the law enforcement pursue their investigations, that the focus is on the evidence, right? It's not the evidence. <laughs> so for law school, this just sort of seems like the obvious place to begin. Um, and so that goes back a little bit to earlier we were talking about risk assessments and so on, robust decision-making matrices. And I think there was something on your website that I saw on your website about the National Institutes of Health having adopted a new uh, decision-making matrix of some kind. And these, you know, prosecutors use these sorts of tools. Uh, many people in the legal community in different postures use these kinds of tools just to sort of ensure that you're asking all the right questions before you take action, like arresting someone. Do you want to talk a bit about yeah. No, absolutely, because I, I think this goes to the point of what are some of the next steps moving forward and why it's so important that the China initiative remains something of the past. The victory for the China initiative was the decriminalization of these activities, that the DOJ would focus less on this and defer more to federal grant agencies so the federal grant agencies can actually do their internal processing on how they assess risk, risk mitigation, foreign influence, and make that publicly available, which then universities can go ahead and create their own internal policies. Now, whether we agree with all of it is one thing, but it needs to be written down and it needs to be publicly available. So then everyone in the public has an opportunity to provide feedback and critique. That's a part of our process here in, in the United States. And so one of the biggest things that ASF has been working on is working across multiple federal grant agencies. The DOD was the first to push out not only their matrix, but a policy memorandum that outlines their due process. The National Institutes of Health provided their matrix, and we're working to see um, similar developments with the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. I think it's very important that many of these discussions and matrices are coming out on the public sphere because we do not want these sort of decisions and assessments happening just behind the scenes, right? This is, these are very difficult questions. We, we actually need the whole community, the scientific community, legal community, the scholars on the ground and university leaders to be all involved in this discussion. Because even if you don't get many of these matrices right, we need to be able to at least publicly criticize them and make sure there's changes. We need a period where we can assess on the ground how it's being implemented and then make updates in case there are any unintended or disproportionate impacts to the Asian American and specifically the Chinese American immigrant community. Um, those types of changes are difficult, even more challenging than ending the China initiative. 
because it requires a lot more nuance, it requires a lot more data and, and research. But we can't even make those steps with the federal grant agency if the China Initiative returns. If the China Initiative returns, all the resources of the civil rights advocacy group are going to be focused on that and that alone because it's going to go, it, the consequences are even more severe. Um, but I can't say the consequences for getting around with the federal grant agencies aren't severe as well. We've heard of so many stories of families who've lost everything, their homes, their livelihood, their reputation. For many of the scholars and scientists, this is not just a job, this is everything. And so we want to be mindful that you know this is still an ongoing problem, but every step forward we make can at least improve the lives of, of people in the here and now. Could, can I add something about the evidence uh, that yes, you mentioned? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, uh, the United States has an adversarial system that uh, the defense and, uh, and the prosecutor are, you know, they're, they're adversaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, as, as, as soon as they uh, prosecute, uh, indict somebody, they want to win. Uh, and, uh, or even, you know, that ASF had a, a webinar that uh, a for former or, or current um, US attorney it was talking about the, the fact that the, uh, the performance was judged by how many cases you won, uh, how many years you put people in prison. And it is, it's definitely not uh, judged by how many cases you dropped because, because you made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so, what you know, I, I can tell from my own uh, personal experience once you are charged, it's an extremely difficult situation. You know, a lot of things, you know, you have all this pressure, you have this financial pressure, you, you know, when they come here and offer you a plea deal, what do you do? You know you're innocent, but you, if you go to trial, you may lose and, <clears throat> and it takes a lot of money. So, so that's why I'm saying, you know, again, coming back to this messaging, this issue, the best thing is to prevent it from happening. Once you are charged, it's a no-win situation. And you know, the drop case that's very, very rare. So uh, coming back to, to the question there, I mean talking about this is really very, very important. Spread the truth because there are a lot of untruths uh, flying around. And and one those hundred and twenty thousand Japanese were sent to internment camps, nobody was asked first whether you are for Japan or against Japan. You know, I'm sure all these China initiative cases, nobody come here and say, well, you vote Democrat or, 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 or Republican first. You know, so I don't think you know, having a, a posture of uh, anti uh, the CCP would help. You know, as, as Jessica said, our community is just as diverse as any community. Right. There are many people who are against China, uh, mainland. Uh, many people who are for mainland. And, and I don't think these discriminatory uh, process distinguish one group from the other. So we just have to uh, fight against this injustice towards the whole community. And if I can add, I think the important role of attorneys in this space because much of what Dr. Xi mentioned could have been prevented with more educational efforts. So for example, letting the general public understand that just because someone is charged doesn't mean that they're actually guilty of that accusation. Um, many people come here as first generation immigrants with a very um, deferential attitude towards government decisions. And so if they're being charged by the Department of Justice, there's a sense of, oh, they must clearly have a good reason for this. And this has led to a lot of stigma. I've talked with scientists who can't come out publicly, but they've been completely cut off by their whole community, by friends, by colleagues who didn't understand that basic knowledge that you can't just, just as someone's chart does not mean like, oh, they're, they're completely guilty, stay away from them. The other thing was that even the media needed to be educated early on. Um, in the early years of the China Initiative, uh, it was very challenging for us. We would see the media copy and paste the DOJ website for their headlines, which was very misleading for the public. And I would see very different stories. For example, when I spoke 
with one student who I saw the news article on them, but then when they spoke to me in person, it was a very completely different reality. Um, the other part is, of course, the know your rights for this community. Because they are a community that believes that scholarship dialogue is so important, when they speak with the FBI, they speak for a long time. And as we attorneys know, you shouldn't be having just this conversation about your whole life with an FBI agent. Um, but that is a know your rights issue. That's an area where attorneys should be very engaged in this work to help this community navigate because they are easy targets. The professors have everything published. One of the professors I mentioned, Professor Ami Hu, the reason the FBI got him was they Googled him. They Googled information on him and said, well, you didn't have this, and we Googled it. So it's all publicly available information. And also the students, international students, make for easy targets because when they're pushed out of the country, many of them don't want to pursue litigation or try to find ways to find justice. They just want to go back to their parents and maybe study in Britain or Australia. We had one student that was forced out here in the US and now they're in Australia study. They never want to go back here. They're just traumatized. So we have to recognize that the legal community has a responsibility for this population that is particularly vulnerable to make sure they actually know their rights, navigate it, and so we can destigmatize some of the reasons. So I think this is a good note for us to end on because we have actually blown past our, our announced time. We wanted to actually uh, end the, the, the formal session a little early so that we could have an informal sharing some discussion and so on afterwards, which we still can do for a little bit. I think we can still keep the room. We still have some food here. We have some uh, drinks still here. So we do welcome people to linger a bit and speak directly uh, with the panelists. Uh, but I just want to then thank you all for your uh, comments and say this is this is one of those talks where we're not just presenting something as a as a done and deal package of knowledge. You can take this knowledge with you and leave. This is actually a kind of a call for help. Right? That there is a need here. This is an ongoing developing situation. Just Tuesday, the House of Representatives was considering and approving all of these pieces of legislation. I don't know how many of those representatives actually read the legislation because we hear that they rarely do, um, but I haven't yet, and I know I need to make time to do that. There were quite a few pieces, they're complex. Um, they need to be scrutinized. So there's a need for people with legal skills to analyze them and to actually pick them apart and say, well, does this make sense? Does this add up? Does this conflict with other legislation? Is it consistent? Is it even, uh, enforceable, is it viable? You know, is this good or bad drafting, etc. I mean, there are all kinds of things for lawyers to do and for law students to do. So this is really just an attempt to raise awareness and to call upon uh, the legal community to try to step up in this moment. And so the, the comment in the back from someone in a nonprofit, what is to be done? Well, step up. <laughs> there is work to be done for your organization as well, as I'm sure you probably are already. Thank you all so much for coming out today. Thank you to those online who have been sticking with us since we have gone two minutes late. Um, and please just stay on for some food. Uh, thank you, Pat.